As Sean said, we're in our last week of our Home for the Harvest series. And when Pastor Brandon asked me to preach on community, I was like, Psh, that's easy. I'm living that life. But then I was like, the reality of putting into words what community looks like and what it actually means to me was, it, it was kind of difficult. I was like, what is community and how is community so important and what does community look like? So I'm going to leave you with that for a second. We're going to play a quick 30 second clip if we're ready back there. What's the thing that you built that you're like the, that you liked the most building? Was there anything? Good relations. What? Anything to please, sweetie, bye. You're most proud of building your relationship with grandma? Is that <laughs> what you just said? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I find a man like you someday. No, oh, she not likely. <laughs> <laughs> You're too good to be true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not likely. <laughs> not likely. <laughs> when I thought of community, I know it's silly, but that was the reality of what was most important to him. His relationship with his sweetie. And I know community can mean our relationship with our spouse, but community can also mean our relationship with our friends, our relationship within the church, our relationship with our family outside of the church, immediate family, the list goes on, right? And as we think about what was most important to grandpa, I'd like to use this video as a platform to take a deep dive into what is critical to Jesus and I'd like to propose that relationship, community, and friendship are essential to him. Let's pray before we open the Bible. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this community. Holy Spirit, would you come and penetrate the heart, transform the mind. And Jesus, hold our hand as we walk in this journey of becoming a student of you and your relationship and community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's see. Let's jump here. Merriam-Webster defines community as a unified body of individuals, a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society, and a group linked by common policy. But let's take it one step further and add friendship to the definition of community. Historically, the origin of friendship has not changed much, meaning the core benefit of doing life with a community of friends has superseded generations, trends, and even needs. We see that friendship provides grounding, safety, comfort, the experience of trust and respect, and the value of being understood by those that we choose to surround ourselves with. As they look at this, some of the greatest in history write quote, quotes like Helen Keller. She says, I would rather walk with a friend in the dark than alone in the light. C.S. Lewis, the greatest C.S. Lewis, he says, friendship is unnecessary. Like philosophy, like art, it has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things that which give value to survival. Oh, come on now. And the greatest, let's see if I could pull this off, Piglet from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered. Yes, Piglet. Nothing, said Piglet, taking Pooh's paw. I just wanted to be sure of you. <laughs> Before we get into our text, I want us to take a look at whom was Jesus's community, right? He walked in community and whom he walked with was essentially important to his story and what we glean and learn from him. Jesus's community involved the 12, and we're going to start with the 12. 
We know the 12, the apostles that held no qualification to be apprentices to the savior of the world. They were average, average men at best, but Jesus saw something in them as he does in us, unknown even to them. They left everything to follow him. And with that simple step of obedience, he molded them into fishers of men. But Jesus also walked with the big three. The big three being Peter, James, and John, right? These three were present for miracles that the others were not. Jesus specifically brings these three along with him to Jairus' house, right? When he raised his daughter from the dead, dead in Mark 5. Then he also took these three up the mountain for the miraculous transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew 17. All three turned out to be big time leaders of the early church, though we are all followers of Jesus, not are called to lead the founding of churches, right? And write gospel accounts. But perhaps Jesus took the extra care to personalize the apprenticeship with these three because of what lay ahead for them. He also walked with the one whom he said he loved, John. The apostle John referred to himself in John 14, 13 as the one Jesus loved. He reclined on him at the last supper, but John's loyalty as a friend to Jesus surpassed his speech. He was there for him in the garden and the only one of the 12 at the foot of the cross. Perhaps John was most eloquent with his words among other gifts, but Though we get a very matter-of-fact view of the gospel account of Mark, John wrote a palpable picture of what it felt like to be close to Jesus. An important quality to embrace and understand as we seek even our own friendship with him. And lastly, we have whom we're going to dive deep into today, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I want to spend the rest of our time here today learning about community by looking at when Jesus met Mary and Martha and fast forward in their relationship with Jesus when the miracle took place when Lazarus was raised from the dead. If you want to open your words with me to Luke 10, 38 through 42, we're going to talk about when Jesus visits Mary and Martha I'm going to move a little bit quick here because I want to cover some good ground. So I'm going to read through this real quick. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. But Martha became exasperated with finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many distractions? Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted and I won't take that privilege from her. I believe we can understand this text better, and I want to just break it down real, real right quick here for you. Two people that we've witnessed in the story. We witness Mary, and we witness Martha. But I want to talk to you about a little bit of their characteristics of who Mary and Martha are, and let's see if we can relate here. See, Martha had to be in charge. She needed to let Jesus lead, but she was a woman weighed down by regular social norms and domestic duty in a position of authority over her household, which was unusual in the times and the culture, right? She was hospitable and outgoing, right? She invited Jesus into her home and she was the hostess. She was gregarious. She openly rebuked, we learn in the scripture, Jesus about not caring that Mary wasn't helping pretty gregarious. She was motivated. She got things done and served guests well. She was known for being comfortable with Jesus. 
She knew him, respected him as an authority. And we could know that when we fast forward in their relationship, that it is Martha that goes straight to Jesus after Lazarus dies. Martha is, in our generation, the busy mom wearing lots of hats, unsure of if she's doing it right, a messy house, and yet she invites Jesus in. I like to propose that Jesus is coming into town. My house is not clean. <laughs> I have dishes in the sink. I have laundry hanging on the rails. I just got home from a softball game at one o'clock in the morning, and my house is a mess. Who's with me? I know not everybody, because we have Mary's in the house. And Mary, she wanted to be physically close to Jesus. I'm telling you guys, this is my best friend. And I'm so envious of this relationship because in the morning she wakes up, she gets her coffee and she sits and she reads her word. She wants to be personally close to Jesus. And I, I'm telling you, with three littles in the house, I don't get to sit and drink my coffee in the morning and read my Bible and want to be personally close to Jesus. I'm washing the dis dishes praying. I'm brushing the little one's hair praying, right? So Mary, she listens to his every word. In this account, when Mary and Martha meet Jesus, she actually forgets about her chores and the preparation of the meal. That's me. Oh, that's me, man. I'm like, oh, I forgot to get you some water. Would you like some water? <laughs> but as we fast forward in their relationship, we can note that when Lazarus dies, Mary waits at home. She weeps while understanding that Martha goes to Jesus, right? Mary is the mom that wakes up, reads her Bible, drinks her coffee, and meets with Jesus daily. Who's Mary in the house? Come on. What I want to understand from this text in Martha is, Martha's opened her house, right? She's opened her home. Jesus has come into town. What I want us to grasp from this is that relationship was not forged with Jesus because of the hospitality. We can step into community by way of hospitality, but relationship is not forged with Jesus because of hospitality. See, Martha was more concerned about Mary, what Mary was doing, and Jesus called her out. Jesus desires a deep relationship with us, but not service at the cost of relationship. Let me say it again. Jesus desires a deep relationship, but not service at the cost of relationship. I can only imagine that Martha's house looked like what mine would look like, right? Laundry hanging, dishes in the sink, floor dirty. And Jesus taught the distracted Martha to sit still in his presence. See, true hospitality within community is selfless. It isn't a perfect dinner party, a magazine-worthy house, not even a tasty meal or spick and span house. True hospitality and community is being emotionally available, opening yourself up to people, welcoming them into your life and space. It involves conversation, listening, and exchange in relationship and uncomfortable levels of vulnerability. We may impress ourselves by our strengths, but we connect, we may impress people, I'm sorry, by our strengths, but we connect with them and know them in our vulnerability. Yeah, that's good. Let's move on. As we continue to learn about Jesus's relationship with Mary and Martha, the next interaction takes place with the three when Mary anoints Jesus with the perfume and then again in John 11, right? So let's jump there. I want to frame this story. If you want to open your word to John 11, we got a lot to cover here, 17 through 44, but I'm going to preface what's about to take place here. In John 11, Lazarus is sick. Okay, Mary and Martha send someone to tell Jesus that his dear friend is sick, but when Jesus hears, he delays. 
and Lazarus dies. Jesus is on his way to Bethany, right? We see here in John 11, and he's entering a scene of mourning. Mary and Martha are disappointed. They know Jesus could have healed their brother. But in Mary and Martha would have taken Lazarus. Let's break this down real quick. If Mary and Martha would have taken their brother Lazarus to the hospital and Jesus was there, the practice of Jesus would be considered a malpractice, right? Lazarus was sick. He needed to be healed. And instead, Jesus delayed and sent him home. Let's say he was in the hospital. He sent Lazarus home instead of performing an emergency surgery. So we enter a scene. Jesus is coming into Bethany and Mary and Martha are completely distraught. They're mourning, they're hurt, and they, they don't understand what just happened. Okay, so let's read Jesus, um, John eleven seventeen 17 through 44. Verse 17 says, Jesus arrived in Bethany and found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. I want to take a, I want to pause right here. Dead in the tomb for four days. I want us to make note of the historical context here of being dead for four days. So four days was extremely significant as the Judaic law taught that through the third day, the spirit had actually remained in the body and there was a hope of a, of a resuscitation to life. Okay, this makes the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead way more important, right? We understand that the community around him believed that the soul would hover actually around the body for three days after the death, hoping for the re-entrance of the soul. But once the body started to decompose, day four, and the corpse would change color, the soul would know there's no going back and depart once and for all. Okay, let me lay that there. Verse 18, let's go on. Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to see Martha and Mary. They came to comfort them about their brother Lazarus. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to greet him, but Mary stayed home. Take note here, right? Two sisters, two reactions, two responses, right? Martha heard Jesus was coming and she runs to him, but Mary stays home. Verse 21 says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But I know that even now God will give you anything you ask. Jesus said, your brother will rise and be alive again. Martha answered, I know that he will rise to live again at the time of the resurrection on the last day. We go on. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Everyone who believes in me will have life even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never really die. Martha, do you believe this? My favorite part, guys. Martha answered, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God. You are the one who was coming to the world. Let's pause right here. Because we presume that Martha has, in this context, she's already lost her parents. And at, she's at her home with three siblings now, Mary and Martha, and has just lost her brother Lazarus. And with that loss, Martha's lost the male, male in her life, but she's also lost all provision in her life. We understand that two women alone in her culture at that time, Mary and Martha, did not have the options that women have now. See, Lazarus wasn't only her dear brother, he was her source of income and protection. This law strike to the core of everything that Martha feared most in her life. She's looking at her future eyes filled with fear and her reaction is, to argue with Jesus. <laughs> Come on, guys. Jesus comes down the road asking her a different question than the one she's actually really wanting to ask him. Why didn't you save my brother? And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? 
the, this, this blows my mind because Jesus' timing, notice here, he's not asking Martha if she believes in something she's already seen. Lazarus is still in the grave, right? We know the story, but Lazarus is still in the grave. He's dead and she has no evidence that this will change. Remember four days? Jesus' questions cuts to the hardest thing that she will ever be asked. Has she known him deeply enough, followed him far enough, understood his heart and identity enough to believe that he is who he says he is? And in this moment, Martha figures it out. This is hope for me, the Martha that figures it out. Don't forget that we are talking about the mom with many hats, the one who's in charge, the one who instead, we, does, she doesn't weep with Jesus, she argues with him. When Martha has the chance to respond distracted, she gets it right. She acknowledges Jesus as the way, the truth, and the resurrection life. This breathes hope to the mama carrying the many hats who's wondering if she got it right, crying out and arguing with Jesus. Let's move on. Verse 28 says, after Martha said these things, she went back to her sister, Mary. She talked to Mary alone and said, the teacher is here. He is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she stood up and went quickly to Jesus. Verse 30, he had not yet come into the village. He was still at the place where Martha met him. The Jews who were in the house com comforting Mary saw her get up and leave quickly. They thought she was going to the tomb to cry there, so they followed her. Are we, are we tracking here? So now Martha has come back home, and she's saying, Mary, Jesus is here. Mary knew Jesus was there, but she's saying, he's asking for you. He wants you to come. Verse 31 also says the Jews that were in the house were, so this is her community, right? They were with her, mourning with her. They're all crying. They think that she's gonna go to the tomb so they get up and go with her, okay? Verse 32 says, Mary went to the place where Jesus was. When she saw him, she bowed at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus saw Mary crying and the people with her crying too, he was very upset. They said, Lord, come and see me. And then one of the most famous verses in the Bible, 35, Jesus wept. The response of Jesus in this story is one of the most widely shared words in the emotion and the, and the shortest verse in the scripture where Jesus weeps, right? Right? He says, what I, want us to, what I want us to see here is a glimpse into community of what Jesus is displaying. Jesus at this time ministered truth to Martha. He said, this is who I am. But Jesus ministered tears to Mary. And this is just but a glimpse into community. This is the epitome of knowing Jesus and him knowing us and what we need when we need it. And this is what community looks like. If we only ever tell people truth, only ever, they're going to despise you. If we only just extend love to people, they don't respect you. But if you're telling, and if you're only telling people truth without relationship, they're not going to listen to you. See, Jesus heard Mary and it broke him. See, he's such a good balance of ministering truth and ministering tears. See, truth without love is just mean and love without truth is meaningless. Come on, guys. The beauty of living in community is understanding the ministry, the ministry of truth and tears like Jesus displayed. Because again, truth without love is just mean and love without truth is meaningless. 
Verse 36, we're gonna move on. And the Jews said, look, he loved Lazarus very much. But some of them said, Jesus healed the eyes of the blind man. Why didn't he help Lazarus and stop him from dying? Again, feeling very upset, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a large stone covering the entrance. He said, move the stone away. Martha said, but the Lord, but Lord, it has been four days since Lazarus died. There will be a bad smell. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> Martha was the sister of the dead man. Verse 40. Then Jesus said to her, remember what I told you. I said that if you believed, you would see God's divine greatness. Verse 41. So they moved the stone away from the entrance. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you will always hear me, but I said these things because of the people here around me. I want them to believe that you sent me. After Jesus said this, he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with pieces of cloth. He had a handkerchief covering his face. Jesus said to the people, take off the cloth and let him go. Okay, so I want to break this down real quick. The miraculous has just taken place, right? Lazarus is raised from the dead. We can see that Jesus, but... We can see that Jesus takes one step further and he tells the sisters and the community around Lazarus, Mary, and Martha to, to move the stone away. And at this point, Martha protests again. She says, which I'm not surprised by this at all, but she's, communica she's communicating with Jesus that if we take, if we move the stone, it's going to smell. And he is saying, like, it's, she's saying it's the smell real bad, real, real bad. <laughs> He's been behind a rock for four days, right? And in an, Isra in an Israeli climate, I think that body is going to reek, right? Like, and, and here we go. This is Martha again. This is her relationship with him. But I wonder, this is what I wonder at times, if this is our sticking point as well. We agree that G Jesus can resurrect our pain and grief. We know he can bring life from death. We've seen it, but we falter when it comes to letting him bring out what we've buried. We've carefully hidden away that childhood abuse, not wanting to revisit it. We know he can transform it, but we don't want to smell the stench beforehand. We've put the resentment on a cold stone shelf, smothered it in grave clothes, and we don't want Jesus to examine it too closely to remind us of the stink. We've placed unmet dreams in the tomb out of reach of prying resurrection artists who will remind us of them and decay where we're allowing them to set in. If we hand our burden over to Jesus for resurrection, we know they could stink all the way to heaven. We know they could make us smell as well. Unlike Martha, the stench is often our own making but we don't want to roll that stone away. Let me be brave enough to share with you. The power of community is that it rides with you in the dirty, filthy, rancid times of life. Because community is invested in your sanctification. And resurrection stinks. If Jesus is going to resurrect it, it's probably going to be smelly and messy before it gets good. If he's going to create new life out of our old hidden things, we'll have to listen and obey as he calls us out of the dark place. And the beauty is community is invested in seeing us raised from the dead. Community is invested in your sanctification and resurrection stinks. We learn that Martha, in the midst of going and protesting to Jesus about somebody else's stink, that the miracle came forth.
Oh, it's so good. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and see, community at the Rock of Roseville, and I'm just going to plug this here, is invested in your sanctification. And I know that the miraculous takes place just like Martha witnessed from Lazarus. The miraculous takes place because we're willing to stand when that resurrection is stinky. Let's stand. Let's stand. We're going to pray in a minute here, but before we do... I'd, lo- I'd like to offer here that Jesus, the Son of God, who existed from all eternity, who had perfect fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, came to live on this earth and felt the need to do so in community. The ultimate act of friendship is he dies for us all in an effort to bring us in. See, Martha declared and Mary worshiped. And it was through their friendship with Jesus that their souls flourished more than they knew. And in hard times, it came out. You see, Jesus dying for us on the cross means that we have a God who truly knows us, yet loves us anyways. And that's really what community is all about. See, as a mother of three, myself, I can tell you that one of the most beautiful things that I've accomplished in my life was birthing my three kids. But what does it matter if I'm unwilling to milk them, burp them, change their diapers, and rear them? What does it matter? And Jesus offers us new birth. And see, what he does is he hands us over to spiritual moms and dads, brothers and sisters, to help you grow and mature in what looks messy, dirty, and stinky at times. But that's what makes community so special. And how will I respond? Have I been burned by community? Yeah. Has community hurt? Yeah. Is community difficult? Yeah. I was talking to a friend this weekend. I'm going to close with this. And she shared how she wanted to go to somebody that didn't know her well so that she could have a bipartisan input in this. And I sat there and I was like, that makes sense. I understand what you're saying. I know where you're going. But the reality of a bipartisan input on somebody that doesn't know you isn't really going to have what in mind what God has in store for you in the call on your life, right? And I was like, truly, the people that you really want to go to are community. Because I know that my community has picked me up when I've looked stinky. I know that my community has come and held my hand when times were difficult. And mostly, they've wept with me. And Jesus' response to Mary is, is exactly, and Martha, is exactly what we need to look for within community and exactly how we should respond within community. And I'm telling you, I don't want to always be vulnerable with people. I don't always want to open up and let you in and learn all the things because it's not real pretty. Sean mentioned earlier, every relationship outside of my relationship with God is broken. But I've learned from living within community that I can live just like Jesus did. And I can learn from him and I can walk with him and I can talk with him and I can learn from the people around me. And I want to pray today. I'm going to have Sean come up with me. 
And, and as I was preparing the message for this weekend and living in community, I got bombarded with life. And our dear friends lost their brother and they're holding the service today. And my daughter got a last minute tournament added on the schedule. And I think if you guys kind of heard me a couple of weeks ago, she's been dealing with fear really bad in the softball game. And I wanna be there for her. And I wanna be there for my best friends. And the Lord was like, what, what's going on here? What's happening, Ravana? And I really felt an attack. I felt an attack because the reality of being in community is being there with those that you're in community with. And what I felt like the Lord speak to me on was that we've held ourselves back from community because we've been burned so many times. And so the reality of allowing Jesus to come into a messy house is, is no more because we've been burned by the people that we're with. So I'd like to propose to you today that Jesus wants you to live in community because community is invested into your sanctification. We want to see those roots of hurt gone. We want to see those dreams ignited. We want to see you come alive once again. We want to see you walk in the call that Jesus has for your life. And we've been so stuck in the stinky part. We've been so stuck in the resurrection that we can't move into the miraculous of Lazarus being raised from the dead. There's a wall and this weekend, yesterday, I saw Harmony go up to the plate and we're living, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this message with her throughout the week, right? Because I'm communicating with her what I'm going to share on and, and, and bouncing ideas with her, right? And she went up to the plate yesterday and I told her, Harm, there's a brick wall. It's the resurrection. It's that stinky part. There's a brick wall and it's fear in her life. There's a brick wall and it's waiting for you to bust through. And guess what? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And she hit the best line drive into left center that she's ever done. And guess what? She has to go up again and do it at the next set bat. And she has to go up again and do it at the next set bat. And she has to go up again at the next tournament and do it again. And every time I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And guess what? Even when it's dirty and you're vulnerable and you don't wanna share and you don't wanna open up and you don't want the reality of what God has for you to come into your life, He will come and He will be and He is good and He will put community in your life that is good because guess what was the best part about yesterday? Her whole team knows she's been struggling. Her whole team knows. And when she hit the ball, you would, it was like if she got a grand slam. <laughs> and, I, and they were jumping up and down and they were pounding on the fence and they're like, yes, arm, you did it. And community does that for you. I'd like us to put our hands out. And specifically, I want to speak to the ones who feel like they don't add value to community right now. Because I want to say, and I want to propose that you add so much value. Whether you're a Martha or a, you're a Mary, you add so much value in community. And the fear of being vulnerable in community has held you in the tomb. And the Lord is saying, I wanna perform the miracle. I'm going to bring community around you that unwraps the cloths and that stands with you as resurrection stinks.